This is Stephen Todman, pediatric cardiologist at LSU in Shreveport. Today we're going to go over endocarditis, myocarditis, and pericarditis as part of the pediatric board review series. So for our first vignette, we have a previously healthy six-year-old girl who refuses to walk. She has an eight-day history of fever and fatigue. Her temperature is 101.4 degrees Fahrenheit, and her heart rate is 115 beats per minute. She has a new systolic heart murmur, her left knee is warm and mildly swollen, and she is admitted to LSU for evaluation and treatment of possible septic arthritis and osteomyelitis. Blood culture is drawn the first day. Continuing on, the orthopedic surgeon drains fluid from the left knee, and the next day she remains febrile, the murmur persists, and gram-positive cocci grow from her blood and joint fluid. Now the second vignette represents another uh, type of the same pathology. So a 14-year-old boy who has cyanosis and tetralogy of Fallot and last under underwent surgery at the age of four years presents to the emergency department with a fever. He appears acutely ill. An echocardiogram report demonstrates a narrowed conduit from the RV to the pulmonary artery as well as a small leak across the VSD patch. Continuing on, one week prior to admission, his mother pierced his nose at home so that they could have matching nose rings. His nose subsequently became inflamed and swollen. After his initial presentation, his condition rapidly worsens and he requires intubation and inotropic support. An echocardiogram demonstrates a mobile mass within the conduit. Blood culture demonstrates Staphylococcus aureus growing in less than 12 hours. As you may realize, these two vignettes represent the subacute and acute form of endocarditis. Turning towards the pathogenesis of endocarditis, there are two important factors uh, to be aware of. First is that there's a damaged area of endothelium, and the second is that there's bacteremia. So how does that take place? We have structural heart abnormalities with a significant pressure gradient or turbulence can result in endothelial damage. And this endothelial damage can cause thrombus formation with deposition of sterile clumps of platelet and fibrin. Prosthetic valves or prosthetic materials used in surgery also can promote deposition of a sterile thrombus. The nonbacterial thrombus provides a nidus for bacteria to adhere and eventually forms an infected vegetation. Platelets and fibrin are deposited over the organisms, leading to enlargement of the vegetation. So now let's turn from the formation of the thrombus and vegetation to the major suspects. So who are the major suspects with bacterial endocarditis? We have alpha hemolytic strep or strep viridans. That's the most common cause of endocarditis in patients who have had dental procedures or in those with dental caries or periodontal disease. The usual suspect in postoperative endocarditis, as well as IV drug users, is staphylococci, particularly staph aureus. Fungal endocarditis has a particularly poor prognosis. It occurs in sick neonates, in patients who are on long-term antibiotics or steroids, or after open-heart surgery. Of note with fungal endocarditis, emboli from friable vegetations can produce serious sequelae. Infective endocarditis associated with indwelling catheters, vascular catheters, prosthetic materials, and prosthetic valves are often associated with staph aureus or coagulase negative staphylococci. There is an acute form and a subacute form of bacterial endocarditis, and case one represents the subacute form. The subacute form is often, as we said, strep viridans. You see a prolonged course of low grade fever. You see nonspecific complaints, which include fatigue, arthralgia, myalgia, weight loss, exercise intolerance, as well as diaphoresis. Case two is an illustrative example of the acute form of bacterial endocarditis. Often it is seen with staph aureus. Char characteristics of the acute form are that they, it is a rapidly progressive and fulminate. You see high spiking fevers and the patients appear severely ill. Now we'll turn to the physical exam findings in bacterial endocarditis starting with the most common. A heart murmur is nearly universal. Fever is common as well, and it's, you see it between 80 to 90% of patients with bacterial endocarditis. 
Fever is typically between 101 degrees Fahrenheit and 103 degrees Fahrenheit. Splenomegaly is common as well, seen in about 70% of cases. Skin manifestations appear in about 50% of patients. They can be secondary to microembolization or as an immunologic process. You can see petechiae on the skin, mucous membranes, or conjunctiva. Osler's nodes, which are tender, pea-sized red nodes at the ends of the fingers or toes, are rare in children. And Janeway lesions, which are small, painless hemorrhagic areas on the palms or soles, are rare. Splinter hemorrhages is another physical exam finding that you should be aware of with bacterial endocarditis. Embolic or immunologic phenomena in other organs are present in about 50% of cases. Pulmonary emboli with left to right shunting uh, is in one example. You can see seizures and hemiparesis seen in about 20% of cases from embolization to the central nervous system. And these seizures and hemiparesis are more common with left-sided defects or with cyanotic heart disease. Hematuria and renal failure can occur. Roth spots, which are oval retinal hemorrhages with pale centers located near the optic disc, can occur in fewer than 5% of cases. So let's turn to the laboratory abnormalities that can be seen with bacterial endocarditis. Positive blood cultures are present in between 50 to 90% of patients, and the lower end uh, of that percentage is seen particularly when they're pretreated with antibiotics. About 80% of patients demonstrate anemia with hemoglobin levels lower than 12 grams per 100 milliliters, and leukocytosis with a left shift can be seen as well. ESR can be increased. You can see microscopic hematuria as well. Now we'll turn towards the diagnosis of infective endocarditis, and I'd like to point your attention to this article uh, that's seen in Circulation 2005, which uh, is just an excellent um, guideline for the diagnosis and management of endocarditis. So I won't be able to cover the entire article here, but I'd refer it to you for your review. The modified Duke criteria are commonly used to make the diagnosis of bacterial endocarditis, and it's divided into definite, possible, and rejected. Definite infective endocarditis is made by pathologic evidence and fulfillment of certain clinical criteria. Path pathologic evidence consists of, one, demonstration of the microorganism by culture, or two, histology in a vegetation or from an embolic site or an intracardiac abscess or histologic evidence of active endocarditis demonstrated in a vegetation or intracardiac abscess. This definite infective endocarditis can also be seen if you fulfill the clinical criteria uh, of two majors, one major and three minor, or five minor criteria, which we'll discuss in a, in a few slides from now. Possible infective endocarditis is made when one of the following is present, and that includes one major criteria and one minor, or three minor criteria. So let's turn to the major criteria. The first is blood culture positive for infective endocarditis. So typical microorganisms consistent with infective endocarditis from two separate blood cultures, which include uh, Viridan strep, strep bovis, the Hassett group, Staph aureus, or community-acquired enterococci in the absence of a primary focus, or evidence of endocardial involvement, which is typically by echocardiography. Minor criteria include predisposing heart condition or IV drug use, a fever greater than 38 degrees centigrade, vascular phenomena like uh, major arterial emboli, septic pulmonary infarcts, mycotic aneurysms, intracranial hemorrhage, conjunctival hemorrhages, and Janeway lesions. Immunologic phenomena include glomerulonephritis, Osler's nodes, Roth spots, and rheumatoid factor. Microbiologic evidence includes positive blood culture, which does not meet a major criterion as noted above, or serologic evidence of active infection with an organism consistent with, in with infective endocarditis. Now we'll turn to the diagnosis and management of suspected endocarditis, particularly blood cultures. So usually three blood cultures are drawn by separate venipunctures over 24 hours unless the patient is very ill. In about 90% of cases, the causative agent is recovered from the first two cultures. If no growth by the second day of, in, of incubation, then two more blood cultures may be obtained. And there's no value in obtaining more than five blood cultures over two days unless the patient received prior antibiotic therapy.
It's not necessary to obtain the cultures at any particular phase of the, of the fever cycle because the patient is continually bacteremic. Adequate volume of blood must be obtained. You have, to, you have to make sure that the nurses are drawing between one and three milliliters in infants and young children and about five to seven milliliters in older children. That's the optimal amount of blood to draw from them. The last point here with blood cultures is that aerobic incubation alone suffices. Regarding the management of bacterial endocarditis, you initiate empiric therapy uh, while awaiting the results of blood cultures, and consultation with an infectious disease specialist is recommended due to the complexity and uh, change and uh, changing organisms and susceptibilities um, that can be seen with infective endocarditis. So it's very easy for the board to ask questions about endocarditis prophylaxis. So my first uh, sample question is, infective endocarditis prophylaxis is not indicated for which of the following? And our choices are prosthetic cardiac valves, previous infective endocarditis, unrepaired cyanotic congenital heart disease, repaired cyanotic congenital heart disease with a residual defect at the site or adjacent to the site of a prosthetic patch or device, or a VSD with a loud murmur. So I'll give you a couple of moments to think about that, and then we will go to the next slide with the answer and, and explanation. So who needs infective endocarditis prophylaxis? Some of these are intuitive and some are less intuitive. So let's go first with some of the ones that are a little bit more intuitive. You need endocardi uh, endocarditis prophylaxis if you have a prosthetic heart valve, including a bioprosthetic and homograph valve. So if you have a mechanical valve or, or uh, someone else's heart valve in you, you need to be prophylaxed. If you have a prior history of infective endocarditis, you need to be prophylaxed. And let's turn, move to the last one, cardiac valvulopathy in a transplanted heart. So if you have someone else's heart in you and, the, and you have a valvulopathy, then you need to prophylax. So these middle three are a little bit less intuitive. So in unrepaired cyanotic congenital heart disease, including palliative shunts and conduits, so if they ask a question about unrepaired tetralogy of Fallot versus an unrepaired VSD, then the answer would be the unrepaired tetralogy of Fallot. And that's why in the answer, in the question before, the answer was the VSD. Completely repaired congenital heart defects with prosthetic material or device, whether placed by surgery or by catheter intervention, during the first six months after the procedure. So what does that mean? If you go to the surgeon and they uh, do perform cardiac surgery, or you go to the uh, do an interventional uh, cardiac catheterization lab and they uh, they put in a uh, a plug or something like that, then you're going to need prophylaxis for the first six months after the procedure. The last one kind of piggybacks on the on the one that I just read. So the repaired congenital heart disease with residual defect at the site or adjacent to the site of the prosthetic device. So what does that mean? So you know you've already bought yourself six months of prophylaxis. Now at six months in a day, you're, you reach a decision point. Then the decision point is, do you have now have a, uh, a residual defect at the site of the surgery or the, a residual defect at the site of the, of the catheter interven intervention? If there's a residual defect, then they get prophylaxis for as long as that residual defect exists. Some other important points to remember is that no prophylaxis is needed for respiratory procedures except for procedures that involve incision or biopsy of the respiratory mucosa, such as tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy. No prophylaxis is needed for GI or GU procedures, and prophylaxis is recommended for surgical procedures that involve infected skin, the skin structure, or musculoskeletal tissue that's infected. Now we'll talk about what you use for prophylaxis. Typically, uh, our mainstay is amoxicillin, 50 milligrams per kilogram in children.
uh, up to two grams in adults. And if you're unable to take oral medication, then you can use ampicillin, cefazolin, or ceftriaxone. If you're allergic to penicillin or ampicillin, you can use cephalexin, clindamycin, or azithromycin. Our next question is an otherwise healthy 12-year-old boy complains of chest pain that's particularly severe over the left precordium when he is laying sup supine. He has had a low-grade fever for the past 24 hours. Physical exam is remarkable only for mild JVD. And of the following, the most likely diagnosis is, and your choices are acute rheumatic fever, costochondritis, infective endocarditis, myocarditis, or pericarditis. So I'll give you a couple of moments to make your selection and we'll then turn towards the answer. So the credit answer choice is pericarditis. So turning towards the etiology of pericarditis, it's typically viral, except when it's not, and then it can be secondary to bacterial infection, tuberculosis, heart surgery, particularly post-pericardiotomy syndrome, collagen diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, complications of oncologic disease, or the toxins they use to treat it. The patients can have a history of an upper respiratory tract infection. They can have this precordial pain that's dull, aching, or stabbing, and occasionally radiating to the shoulder and neck. And the pain may be relieved by leaning forward and may, made, and may be made worse by supine position or deep inspiration. So it's really important to have this picture in your mind of how the typical patient with pericarditis will present. They'll typically be uh, leaning forward, looking uncomfortable, taking shallow breaths. The classic clinical manifestation in pericarditis is this pericardial friction rub, and it's a grating to and fro sound, often triphasic, and that's the classic physical finding. This is an example of the classic EKG findings with acute pericarditis. I'll, take you, I'll give you a couple of moments to formulate an answer about what you think that this EKG shows. And here you see the diffuse ST segment elevations in acute pericarditis. So for the next vignette, um, I call this dead or alive, and you'll soon see why. An 18-year-old boy who we'll call Chris presents to the ER with chest pain, shortness of breath, and tachycardia for three days. The chest pain is described as occasionally radiating to the shoulder and neck. Physical exam demonstrates hypotension, hepatomegaly, distended jugular veins, and muffled heart sounds. The patient's uncomfortable and the pain seems to be relieved by sitting up and leaning forward and is intensified by lying supine or taking a deep breath. Here's our typical EKG finding. So you can appreciate that you have what's called electrical alternands. So you, your voltages are, first of all, your voltages are diffusely small. And then you see the electrical alternands where you see a larger uh, amplitude, smaller amplitude, larger amplitude, smaller, larger, smaller. And this is uh, what you see with a pericardial effusion. And the clinical features that we saw in the slide before also suggest the pericardial effusion on top of the pericarditis. Here's our classic chest x-ray finding. So I'll give you a moment to look at that and interpret it. So this is what we call the water bottle heart. Uh, it's I also refer to it as the quote-unquote cardiomegaly. It's the, the heart is, you can see it looks globular, and the reason for that is that there's fluid in the pericardium and it's distended uh, in a globular fashion representing the filling of the pericardium. There's not cardiomegaly per se, but it's more the fluid in the pericardium. You can also see the markings of pulmonary edema. So one thing to note is that the pericardium is very accommodating. So a relatively large effusion over a long period of time may not send the child into tamponade. 
but a relatively smaller effusion over a shorter period of time can result in tamponade. And of course, there's a, there is an absolute capacity of the, of the pericardium to stretch. So you correctly make the diagnosis of a pericardial effusion and you contact the on-call cardiologist. So you're told to check for pulsus paradoxus, but then the call drops abruptly. I guess he had a bad connection. So what do you do? In a child without arterial pressure monitoring, accurate evaluation requires a manual blood pressure cuff. Pulsus paradoxus may be associated with cardiac tamponade, uh, like from an effusion or constrictive pericarditis, the, or it could be due to severe respiratory difficulties like asthma or pneumonia. So it may not be the cardiac. When a patient's breathing room air, you, you'll note that during expiration, the blood pressure is higher than an inspiration. So you see higher and then lower and then higher and then lower. So you, the pulses paradoxes is kind of an exaggeration of this normal response. So how do you do it? First, you elevate the cuff pressure about 20 millimeters above what you think the systolic pressure is. And then you sl slowly lower the blood pressure until you could hear the carotid cuff sounds for some, but not all of the cardiac cycles. And that will be your A-line over here. So you can see it, you can hear it from uh, during expiration, but not inspiration, expiration, but inspiration. Make note of that, that's your, A num that's your A number. After that, you lower the blood pressure until systolic sounds are heard for all of the cardiac cycles, both in expiration and inspiration. And you make note of that, and that's the B number. So if the difference between A and B is greater than 10 millimeters of mercury, then pulsus paradoxus is present. So pulsus paradoxus is present, what do you do? So you have two choices, uh, one of which will save your patient and the other will hasten his demise. Your choices are 20 cc's per kilo normal saline bolus or IV Lasix. So I'll give you a moment to choose. No pressure. So the correct answer is 20 cc's per kilo normal saline bolus. Hopefully you save the day. If you didn't, here's the, the rationale behind it. So there are two forces that you're dealing with with tamponade. You have the, tamp the force that's compressing the heart, and that you can see these arrows. And then the other force is the force opposing the tamponade, and that would be the intravascular volume, which you don't, which don't have arrows. So you have the, the compressive force, which is the, the, or the tamponading force that you see with arrows, and what's fighting against it is the uh, intravascular volume that's opposing it. So when you give Lasix, where does it draw from initially? As you probably realize, it draws initially from the intravascular volume, and so therefore the only thing, so if you give Lasix, the only thing that was preventing tamponade, you've just removed. So you've removed the, uh, the opposing force of the tamponade, and that's why Lasix is not the correct answer. Uh, as opposed to a normal saline bolus, when you give a normal saline bolus, where does that volume go first? And that's the intravascular volume, so when you give the normal saline bolus, you're, you're adding to a force that's opposing the tamponade. So that is why this is the correct answer choice. Postpericardiotomy syndrome. So this is a febrile illness with an inflammatory reaction of the pericardium and pleura that develops a few weeks to a few months, the median is about one month after surgery, involving pericardiotomy. So if you were a a surgeon and performing a surgery, and uh, a couple of moments after the surgery was completed, the child had a significant adverse event. It doesn't take a genius to figure out that this is probably a post-operative complication. So the problem with postpericardiotomy syndrome is it happens, you know, a, m a month or a couple of months after the surgery or after the uh, surgery or intervention affecting the pericardium. So around the time that they forgot about it or they didn't have it fresh in their mind you know, that's when this, that's when this postpericardiotomy syndrome can present. So it's very important that you take a detailed history to make sure that that's not what the patient's dealing with.
Postpericardiotomy syndrome is characterized by fever and chest pain, and otherwise the manifestations are similar to a pericardial effusion. You can also see le leukocytosis with left shift and elevated acute phase reactants as well. Postpericardiotomy syndrome management uh, is some combination of bed rest for mild cases. You can do NSAIDs such as ibuprofen or indomethacin for mild to moderate cases. Uh, and emergency pericardiocentesis is indicated if you see si signs of tamponade. So our next vignette is, uh, is myocarditis. And I want you to have a serious respect for myocarditis, so much so that I'm telling you what the diagnosis is right from the very beginning. So the first presentation is a five-year-old boy who presents to an outside hospital with a two-day history of abdominal pain and vomiting, poor appetite, as well as decreased activity. So how common is that, do you think, in, the, uh, in your experience uh, for patients to present to the ER with, in, the, you know, in this way? Probably pretty common, and uh, probably 99 times out of 100, turns out that it's acute gastroenteritis or something like that. Uh, and you're generally right about 99% of the time, unless you're not, unless it's the 1% where it turns out to be myocarditis. Turning towards the vitals, let's, uh, you can see tachycardia, and that's, uh, that's particularly concerning because if the child has been up vomiting all night, uh, it's not, not uncommon for them to be dehydrated and sub subsequently tachycardic. And you can also be tachypneic as well with myocarditis. Uh, physical exam demonstrates pallor, diaphoresis, and congestive heart failure. Uh, particularly, you'll see hepatomegaly, you can see a gallop rhythm, and other manifestations of conge congestive heart failure. So the the important take-home point here is that one of the only ways you may be able to make the diagnosis of myocarditis as opposed to uh, acute gastroenteritis or something else may be the congestive heart failure, picking up on the hepatomegaly and gallop rhythm. And that's why physical exam is really, really key. Uh, no matter how many patients in a row you've seen with, uh, with gastroenteritis, make sure you're feeling for livers. Make sure you're listening carefully for gallop rhythms. It's just a very important skill to learn, and it may help you pick up myocarditis in a child. Later in the course of illness, respiratory symptoms become predominant. You can see syncope or even sudden death. But the physical exam findings, again, are consistent with congestive heart failure. Here you see cardiomegaly with prominent pulmonary vascular markings of pulmonary edema. Here's our EKG. I'll give you a moment to take a look at that. So I hope you could appreciate the sinus tachycardia with low voltage QRS complexes with or without low voltage or inverted T waves. You can see VTAC, SVT, atrial fib, uh, or AV block in some children. Management includes some combination of the following depending on the severity and, uh, and the location and type. The, you can see, you can use anti-congestive medications like Lasix. You can use inotropes like dopamine or dobutamine. Oxygen and bed rest can be helpful. You definitely want to aggressively treat arrhythmias. ACE inhibitors and, IVG, and IVIG may be of help. And for severe rheumatic carditis, that would be really the only indication for corticosteroids. So again, the clinical findings suggesting myocarditis, flu-like illness in the preceding month, symptoms of fatigue, malaise, shortness of breath, and chest pain, evidence of congestive heart failure on physical exam, elevated troponins, AV block or arrhythmias on EKG, and decreased ventricular function by echo. But the truth of the matter is, if you uh, uh, as a pediatrician have already thought to get an echocardiogram, you've more than done your part. The key thing about myocarditis is making the diagnosis, and that's why it's so important to be aware of the congestive heart failure. Natural history is that one-third of patients with viral myocarditis experience a complete recovery of normal cardiac function. One-third will experience chronic heart failure or die or require heart transplantation. And a third will improve clinically but show residual cardiac dysfunction. And that's why this is such a, a significant uh, pathology. Well, thank you very much for your attention and best of luck on the boards.